Hi everyone, welcome to Art on the Creek. My name is Anne and we are in my home studio in Parker, Colorado. I'm so happy that you're here today. Thanks for tuning in. You know, if you know me or maybe if you don't know me, one thing that I am kind of synonymous with is dogs. I can't resist dogs. Dogs of all sizes, shapes, I just love them. And I was looking for a photo of something else entirely and now I can't even remember what it was because I ran across this photo of an adorable golden retriever puppy bringing a flower to his humans. So I thought we could take a look at the Meaden paint set again and see if we can get a golden retriever. Are you ready? <laughs> Let's go have some fun. Here is the reference photo that I fell in love with and I just stopped looking for whatever it was I was looking. I don't even remember <laughs> what I was originally searching for. But that picture link will be in the description as will this, my PDF line drawing for you. Um, if you want to trace the photo and uh, have a much more uh, accurate <laughs> re representation of your golden retriever, mine is kind of uh, accentuating the eyes and his cute puppiness. I definitely am going for cute on this one. I really like this palette though for this because that golden, uh, the golden retriever's yellow ochre is just so nice. And this yellow ochre is really bright. And there's a good range of yellows in here. I like the reds. Uh, the browns are awfully nice too, the burnt sienna, the burnt umber. So I think we can really have some fun with this palette. I'm just gonna clean this off and I will be right back. First of all, I'm going to go in with a number 10 round. I'm using a Princeton Neptune round here. And I'm gonna cover pretty much the entire dog with yellow ochre. Now, if you don't have this set, that's fine. Um, just use whatever yellow ochre you have. And please know this is not going to be an accurate pet portrait. It's going to be cute. This is, it's something that's just gonna be sweet and cute. It's not going to be anything uh, that would look like a drawing in an AKC registration book or anything like that. It's just gonna be fun and sweet. And sorry about my head. I've got to uh, see what I'm doing there over by where I drew the tulip. I've got to get in a little tight area there and I didn't want to paint over the tulip at all. So let me zoom ahead to where I've got the entire golden retriever covered with uh, the yellow ochre. And when you're doing this, what you want to do is kind of concentrate the pigment in areas where you see some pretty obvious shadows on your retriever. So let's skip ahead to that point. And to do that, I've got this sped up at 20 times the speed. So if you need to pause, that's absolutely fine. You can pause at the end here and get caught up and kind of see where I got the yellow ochre a little more intense and uh, where I left it kind of pale. So now we're going to go in with the burnt sienna. Now this is the only thing I'm not 100% crazy about on this paint set is the burnt sienna seems to me to be kind of weak. But you know what? It hasn't failed me. I'm still able to do everything that I can do with a regular burnt sienna. I think it's just that I'm used to uh, Daniel Smith. And these paints are, are student grade paints, but um, they claim that they have some uh, pigments and light fastness. But I would want to do a test on that myself, and I haven't. But as far as vibrant colors and just having fun to paint with, I have no complaints. This is a really fun set. I'm using the Princeton Neptune brushes on it this time, but there is also a set of mead and watercolor brushes that you can get. And I've enjoyed those brushes. The, the ferrules can be a little loose sometimes, but just for brushes to play with or uh, take with you, work with gouache, anything like that where you wouldn't want um, anything that's more absorbent. The brushes are really kind of nice. Now what I'm doing is I'm going in with that burnt sienna and just kind of daubing it in where there would be a darker area. And here's where I'm going to mix some of that ultramarine with a little bit of the burnt sienna and come up with kind of a dark brown gray shade. I'm trying to get the shadows and contours in his little face. So when you're painting animals, and again, this is not gonna be a realistic animal, but we still need to have those shadows and features. Remember that there is a skeleton under there. And when you have eyes, the eye sockets, there is a hollow underneath there. And I know that looks shocking right now, but we're going to play with it with a wet brush and smudge it around and do a little bit of blending and get it to look a little, a little better. But we need those underlying shadows. We need the ridges on the eyes and we need the underlying shadows in order to give our little golden retriever a lot of expression. So let me zoom forward a little bit again and we'll get to the next step. Oh, before I do that, um, 
you might want to continually lift off and uh, you'll see me do that uh, throughout here where I take a damp brush and then swipe over an area with a little bit of pressure that is lifting off and then right there you see I'm lifting off above the nose and on the bridge of the nose and then I'm wiping the brush off so I have a thirsty brush it's damp and then I'm just lifting up some of that color so I just want to try and guide those shadows right where I need them so that he doesn't look like a football player <laughs> all right let's zoom ahead to the next step we'll just keep adjusting those shadows a little bit here and now I've got the ears wet or damp and I am dropping in some of that burnt sienna in kind of a dauby sort of way. I don't have any intention of painting every little bit of fur that's on this particular dog. So I'm just kind of creating texture by dropping in the paints in different levels of, of consistency. And now he's got those shadows on his neck, the little area under his chin there. And I need to get a basis for those shadows down while remembering that there are still some highlights there. So I'm kind of going in with a, a mix between the yellow ochre and that burnt sienna and just kind of putting another layer on because it, as it happens with just about every watercolor that you do, once you work on one area, you'll see that the other area kind of needs to catch up or change the value. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, the face, when I worked on that and add a little more shadows, it made the body look really pale and it gets to the point where it can be a distraction for you. So just make sure that you catch up your areas in such a way that it's easy for you to see this painting. And in fact, on this one, I lost a little bit of my line around his mouth and you'll see that at the end um, after we get the flower painted in, but I was able to adjust that really easily. So just continue to daub this, uh, the burnt sienna in on those wet ears, and then I will meet you at the next step. You're gonna to wanna to go ahead and add some of that burnt sienna to where his tear ducts would run down and uh, above his eyes just a little bit. And now we're gonna go in and smooth out that highlight area on the left side for us, his right shoulder. And then we're gonna kinda of make sure that this is completely dry. You're gonna make sure that's good and dry. And that is one thing I can say about this mead and watercolor paper. It's 100% cotton and it really is nice. You can throw an awful lot of water at this and it holds up. So I'm very impressed with this paper, 100%, I recommend it. Um, now we're going to mix a little bit of that uh, purple because I wanna work on the shadow under his chin. I wanna get a darker brown, but I wanna eliminate the gray element to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix the yellow ochre with some of the purple and the purple that I'm using here, they call violet. So it would be a cooler purple. And you can see the way that I mix that in my palette is kind of interesting. I put the violet on the left-hand side and the yellow ochre on the right. And that way I can blend them in the middle, move my brush a little more to the right if I want something that's not quite as dark, or I can bring it over to the violet side and kind of work more yellow ochre in that way if I wanted to get something that was more toward the dark brown side. So I'm just creating the, the shadow and definition here between his ear and his, uh, and his head. And in just a moment, I'm gonna change brushes because this is turning out to be not fine enough of a point. So let me zoom ahead on that and then we'll get a new brush. I do want to do as much as I can while I've still got this number 10 brush in my hand. And I just did a little bit on the ears, but I'm going to switch to my Tracy LeBenzin brush. These brushes are so fun and they come to such a fine hair point that when you're painting hair, they are really quite helpful. Now I'm going into a yellow ochre, kind of a burnt sienna yellow ochre mix here to work on uh, the hairs on his ears. And you'll see what I'm doing is I'm just taking this brush and kind of tapping it around in a lot of different directions. I'm just kind of getting the border of his ears in. And you know, I'm not being any anything precise. I'm just creating texture. You can do this with just about any brush. You don't have to use this Tracy LeBenzin one, but if you have a little bit of fun money and you'd like to try some really beautiful brushes, I do recommend Tracy LeBenzin's. And I will recommend that website down in the description in case you're interested in looking. That one I don't have an affiliate link for, but all of the links that you'll see with, uh, with Amazon or with this Meet and Arts uh, set, actually, those are all affiliate links. One thing I do want to mention to you is if you're enjoying this video and having a good time, and I hope that you are, you might want to consider becoming a member of Art on the Creek. You know, a lot of YouTube creators and instructors use uh, Patreon. I'm one where I don't want to deal with yet another app. 
So what I decided to do was to go ahead and try to do memberships on right here on YouTube. You're already here. So I thought it would be a lot of fun to provide for you content that you don't have to look for anywhere else. You don't have to have a new password. You don't have to log on somewhere else. You can do everything right here from YouTube. Now, what will happen is if you become a member, there are three different tiers available, the Buffalo level, the Red Rocks level and the Pikes Peak level. And at that Pikes Peak level, which is only $9.99 a month, you will have access to exclusive tutorials, early access to uh, reviews and tutorials to select ones, no matter what level you go into. At the Pikes Peak level, you will have a new exclusive tutorial every week. And at the Red Rocks level, once a month. And the good thing to know about this is that everything, every level that you select for instance, if you select the Red Rocks level, you'll also get all of the benefits that are in the Buffalo level and the Pikes Peak level, you'll get all the benefits that are in all three levels. So I'm still kind of ironing out the kinks on this, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. And I know that I owe a huge thank you to Anita. She is uh, one of my first members and I am so grateful to her for supporting my channel. And if a membership isn't right for you, another way that you can support my channel is with a super thanks. That is a one-time gift to Art on the Creek. And, you know, I love doing these. I love doing these tutorials and reviews for you guys, but I will tell you, it does cost money to do these. And um, I'm retired and this is my job in retirement to continue teaching and to bring my, my knowledge to you via this YouTube platform. So every single penny that comes in through the YouTube ads or any kind of collaboration I have with any art companies, for instance, like this meeting collaboration here, or any of the memberships, super thanks, all of that stuff. It all goes right back 100% here to art supplies, to technical equipment that help me continue to make these videos for you. So I hope you're having a lot of fun with this. And please remember, membership or donation is never a requirement. I will always continue to have one or two videos each week that are completely free in my library, accessible. I try, I'm trying to do these reviews once a week. The great thing about becoming a member though is that you would be, have early access to those. So without further ado, let's talk about the coupon. This Mead and Art set, I'll have a link to that, plus an additional link to the Mead and website as a whole. They do just about every art supply you can imagine. So I have a 10% coupon in there. And if you'd like to use it for this particular watercolor set, it's really kind of fun. It comes with a set of brushes, which is a really nice set. And this uh, pad of 100% cotton watercolor paper, 24 watercolors that are in tube format. Now I did buy this palette separately and I filled my watercolor tubes into this palette and I'll link to that palette as well. And it also comes with this water well that is a two-sided ceramic water well. Each side holds about probably a cup of water and it's really very nice. I've gotten to where that's my go-to water container for when I'm working at home in my studio and I really like it. I just um, think it's great to have one reservoir for darks and one reservoir for lights or one that you use to rinse your brushes and one that you keep clean. I've just really always wanted that and never found one that I really like. So this one is a good addition for me. So if you, um, if you want to click on that link and see what Meaden has to offer, that would be maybe a lot of fun for you. I hope it is fun um, because it was a lot of fun for me. So the one thing I will say too about this Meaden set is that a lot of other artists that I've seen their reviews on it, they kind of have a few concerns about it. They say that the paints are streaky, um, that they're, they're not quite, they don't quite behave like other paints. The only one that I found to maybe be true that way, not streaky, but just different is the Burnt Sienna. And like I said, it's the, it's the color is not quite as intense. The, the texture when it goes on, it just seems, you know what, I think what it is, is that I just want it to have more pigment in it and it just doesn't. So, but like I said, I'm using it throughout this entire painting and I'm not having any issues with it. It's just not what I'm used to. So know that, that if you are going to invest in this set, then uh, the Burnt Sienna, you might want to replace that with another one that you like better. But if you get this palette that I got that has those four empty wells there, then you can fill it with whatever you want. The red that I'm using for his little nose is actually that scarlet red. And I think this one is so beautiful. I just love this red. I'm going to go ahead and use it on the tulip later too, so that we can pick up that red. Whenever you're painting, you want to use 
your colors, you want to mix them as much as possible. I like to mix my darks and I like to mix um, any kinds of greens or oranges, all the secondary colors, purples. I really like to mix those because what you can do with your mixes then is repeat those colors elsewhere in your painting. And that really gives a nice cohesive nature for the viewer so that when you're looking at something, it doesn't look flat. It, it looks like everything is just married together and it just gets along better. So this is where I was first playing with uh, his little nose and I ended up making him look like he had a little mustache. So we're gonna sip through this part here just a little bit and then we'll catch up at the next step. If you're drinking coffee or some other beverage, you might wanna set it down because um, you're gonna bust out laughing when you see <laughs> How this guy looks. He looks like Groucho Marx. So I went in with uh, with that number 10 brush again and just lifted that right off. And it worked out actually really quite well because it left just enough shadow there. And then you'll see what I do in a later step. We'll go ahead and uh, just put a few little hairs there and it really does end up looking quite a bit better. I'm going in now with a little bit of that burnt sienna and just going around his eyes just a touch to try and get some of that ridge line accentuated. And now that I've got that horrible mustache out of the way, I can adjust the shadows a little bit more. So I'll just go under his neck and around his muzzle a little bit and now get that completely dry. And now we're switching to a number four brush. I'm going back into that burnt sienna and ultramarine mix that I have. And I think what we're gonna try and do is start to pay a little bit more attention to his little nose. Now this golden retriever has a very, very sweet nose and it's, pink on the front, but that pink is not a solid color. It's, it's very, it's very much a gradient. So what I'm going to do here is go in around and kind of fill in the darker areas. I'm kind of going on top of the nose with little hash lines, because if you look really closely at that uh, reference photo, you'll see the top of the nose has an awful lot of texture to it. So I'm just trying to suggest it. I'm not trying to replicate it exactly because I want this style of painting to be very, very whimsical. So I don't want a lot of detail. I'm just trying to uh, create somewhat realistic uh, features of this dog without making it uh, a realistic portrait, if that makes sense. So let's zoom ahead to the next step and we'll get through the nose here just a little bit. The bulk of his nose was done in uh, wet on damp or wet on wet. And then I did a lot of applying pigment and then lifting it off just to try and get that natural uh, ombre effect of, or a gradient of color. And now I'm switching to a Trakel brush. I love these for their point. They are an elongated round and this is a number four and it comes to a beautiful point. I like to use these for detail. So I'm going to mix up a good pile of ultramarine and burnt sienna and let's jump in and do his eyes. I've got this sped up again, but not quite as fast. You can see I'm taking that brush and kind of making little hairline strokes around the eye. That will serve as negative painting so that his fur and eyelash can incorporate with the eye. I'm going to do the pupils first and don't forget to leave white space. If you do for some reason forget to leave white space, don't worry about it. You can always go back in with a gel pen or an acrylic pen or something like that, even a colored pencil sometimes. I'm, uh, I've added a little bit of that scarlet in the tear ducts because dogs have that bright red um, uh, corners of their eyes. I've got it a little bit uh, toned down though with some bird sienna. And then uh, I've got a medium to dark yellow in the eyes because I want that to be the first layer. And now I'm gonna work on his nostrils a little bit more and I end up changing this again because I realized I made the sides of the nostrils too big. The, the outside of the top of his nose should touch almost that uh, the bottom part of his nose, if that makes sense. The, I left the opening on the sides a bit too large here. So we'll go in and correct that in just a moment. But the nose is basically, it's just kind of done with a whole lot of layers. I, um, you know, this wasn't a plan. It's not, I'm not advising you that this is the way that you should do a dog nose. It's just the way that this particular one worked out for me because it was giving me a little bit of fits. But now you can see here on the muzzle in the front, I'm going in and just creating some very fine hairs with a very faint bit of gray. And I really like that much, much better. The only thing I have to say for myself is it's okay to make a mistake. And I like to show you guys when I do make a mistake in judgment, and then I can have an opportunity to show you how to fix it. Because I feel like if this is gonna to happen to me, and I have been painting for years, 
I think it's probably going to happen to you too. And I can tell you it happens to just about every artist out there. Sometimes you are going down a road and you think, oh, this is perfect. And then you try something and it doesn't work. Well, I want to be able to show you how to correct it, especially with watercolor, because sometimes um, with some pigments, when they stain, it's a little harder to correct things. But uh, this one, this one was pretty, pretty doable. And I really like the final result of the muzzle there. So we're just going to tweak the nose again a little bit and we'll zoom ahead to the next part. And after I'm done futzing around with the muzzle and nose here, that next part is going to be the eyes. And I want to show you right here what we do to achieve really big, soulful, expressive eyes. And this is for this particular style, but I went in with that yellow first, and then I'm going over it with the burnt sienna, and also I'll go in again with the burnt umber on top of it. But I want to create a weight to these eyes. They're big, they're looking up, and the eyeballs themselves, I want them to feel kind of heavy. And you have to be careful because they're in the very same color family as the golden retriever itself. So that's why I added the burnt umber in there to get it just a little bit darker at the bottom. But that's what's going to give it that weight is to have that darkness at the bottom. So you'll see I will swipe some darker color along the bottom and then come in with water and go around the iris of the eye to just kind of get that to blend and move so that you don't have any harsh lines. Now, a lot of animals do have a very defined border on their eyes. Um, this particular golden retriever, his eyes were pretty much um, in shadow, so it was pretty hard to tell what exactly they look like. But uh, you can look at a bunch of different dog pictures and see what, uh, what dog eyes look like and then go from there or you can make these a different color entirely if you want to. The way that I drew him and the way that I'm painting him, there's a lot of room for whimsy. I really want this painting to be fun. I want you guys to have fun. And I wanted to show you how easy it is to just come up with something that is clever and unique. And maybe you could hang this in a child's room. It's kind of that kind of level of whimsy. So now what I'm doing is I've got some green that's already mixed. That was uh, ultramarine and some of the gamboge that was mixed there. And I've just kind of added to that. And um, excuse me, it wasn't gamboge, it was the pale yellow. And I've added to that and made more of it. And so I've got a nice uh, spring green color. And I'm just going in still with that number four Traquel brush. And I'm defining the base layer of the tulip leaves. So we'll go in with a little bit darker green here in a minute and create some definition there. So here you can see I'm using just a little bit darker version of the green. In fact, that is straight from the pan, the deep green. It's a nice blue tone green and it goes well with that to green that we mixed. So I've used that to create a little bit of depth and dimension on the, the stem and the leaves. And again, not going for realism here, just going for uh, definition. And now for the tulip. This one was so fun. I was thinking of those tulips that are kind of uh, red at the base and then at the tips of the tulips they're kind of striped um, where the white comes in. So, you know, it's not definitely that particular flower, but when you're looking at it, you can definitely tell that it is a tulip that has some varying reds in it and maybe some white at the tips. So that's all we're going for. That's what I love about not really focusing on extreme detail and realism because you can be expressive in your strokes. You can um, have a painterly approach to whatever it is you're painting and really make it your own. And that's that's really what I like to do. I know a lot of our of people will say, um, you know, we have a camera, use a camera if you want photorealism. And I, I think that's kind of dismissive. I really like, uh, really like looking at photorealistic painting, but I don't have that kind of patience, you guys. So if you watch my channel at all, you've heard me say that about a million times, but I think that this is really a fun way to paint it just because it it's something that in fact, my kids have told me that they can look at the art that I've created and they say, I know that's yours, mom. I know it from a mile away. So to me, that's a huge compliment. If that's something that you enjoy, then go for it. If it's not your style, then please don't, don't think I'm telling you to change. This is just my way of doing it. There are a million other YouTube artists out there. Please follow a bunch of them. I follow several. So I feel like if you're going to really truly learn and expand your knowledge as an artist, you need to watch several different styles. I never had just one teacher in art and you shouldn't either. Now I've got that scarlet mixed. It's the scarlet red that I'm using and I've got it mixed just again with that pile of uh, a pile puddle <laughs> of ultramarine and burnt sienna up there in the third well up from the bottom, the one just below the green. And I've mixed that. That's where I mixed his shade for the nose. And I wanted to create a little bit of shadows on that tulip. And that is exactly where I got that from. So that will help marry the
that tulip to his nose and remember we have just a touch of that red up in his eyes so that's going to help our viewer look at the painting and it'll help everything marry together so for instance when you first see this painting you're probably going to be drawn to the eyes first but then if the nose were yet a different red and the tulip yet a different color it might give you a little too much tension it's it's kind of a nuance factor when you're painting you really need to decide how much uh, how many different colors do i need to use and i always say fewer is best as few as possible that's the way to really get around things and here's where i realized i left a huge space off of his mouth he almost looked like he had a whole roll of teeth hanging in there <laughs> a whole, or maybe he was holding onto something white in addition to that uh, to the tulip but what i did was i went in and i put a little bit more of that dark mix of the burnt sienna and ultramarine for his lip and then i pulled his upper lip down just a little bit and I just did that by blending some yellow ochre in here. You can see that happening right now. I'll just uh, accentuate the shadows under his eye and on his lip there. And I'm using that mix of violet and yellow ochre to get that done. And my friends, you know what? We're done, but I don't want this to have a white background. I think it just looks too plain. So since we've used a lot of ultramarine here, and that's a good contrast with the yellow, they kind of are opposite each other on the color wheel. Let's really play with this ultramarine. Let's see what kind of uh, separation we can get because, you know, ultramarine is a naturally granulating pigment. This paper has an awful lot of good texture on it. So I'm just going to go in with globs and globs of ultramarine and I'm just kind of gingerly touching it there in through his ears. I don't, I'm not, you know, being too accurate with it all. Um, but I didn't want, to look, didn't want him to look too much like a cut and paste, but for this particular painting, it's fine. If he does a little bit, I'm just trying to blob on <laughs> some ultramarine and get a fun background going for him. You know, it's funny. I think ultramarine is one of the colors that I go through absolutely the quickest on my palette. Uh, that one and Burnt Sienna. How about you? What color do you go through the quickest and which one can't you live without? That's a harder question for me. I don't really know. I know that I use ultramarine an awful lot. And so therefore I use burnt sienna too, because that's how I mix my blacks. But you know, there are so many other colors that I use. I think if I truly had to limit myself to one palette, it would be warm and cool primaries. So a warm and cool red, yellow, and blue, and you know, fill in the blank of whichever ones you want to use. And then I would add yellow ochre, and I would probably add something that's a really intense granulator, like a Mars Black. That would be a lot of fun to have, to be able to mix in with some colors and then turn them into those shadow colors. And other than that, you know, I don't know. I, I love a lot of greens. I love a lot of, um, of the pinks and the purples. And with this Meaden set of 24, you know, you've really got that. You've got the warm and cool primaries. You've got a lot of the secondaries. You're good to go. You've got an awful lot that you can play with here. And that's exactly what I'm doing with this one. While that paint is still wet, I am putting on an awful lot of water. And that's one reason why I love this big, huge, thirsty brush. The Princeton Neptunes tend to be very, very thirsty. I love them. They have just the right amount of feedback. They really, truly are my favorite brush. So going around here with the Ultramarine, we'll put these big blobs of water on here. And then we'll take a look at them when it's all done. Once I had the background on, I did go in and tweak his eyes just a little bit to give them just a little bit more weight. Now let's take a look at him when he's all finished. Well, here's our little puppers all done. And I just really think he turned out to be so sweet and so cute. And look how fun that background is. It almost just looks like tie-dye. I love adding cauliflower blooms. They can really do a lot of great textural effects on our watercolor. We don't have to reserve them for backgrounds. We can use them. In fact, you can use them to make fur. So there's just so much you can do. And I just really appreciate you guys hanging out with me, watching this video. I hope you found it informative. By the way, that's dirty water. But here is that uh, the two weld uh, water cup that I was telling you about. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. I hope everyone has a wonderful, artful week. And I hope you have fun painting a puppy. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye now.